afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Gardening a Vegetable Garden in Soil and in Containers program. I'm Shirley from the library. So today we're very happy to have Master Gardener James Veers as our speaker today. He will share his gardening expertise with us. Jake is a professional master gardener from the Vancouver Master Gardener Association. He has over 40 plus years of experience in gardening. So before we start, um, we acknowledge that Coquitlam Public Library provides service on the unceded traditional territory of the Coquitlam First Nation, which lies within the shared territories of the Swalot, Wetu, Hexi, Mosquitlam, Hopkate, Squamish, and Solo Nations. So uh, thank you, James. Now, uh, thank you, James, for sharing his time with us. So let's welcome James. Thank you. Thanks very much, Shirley. Uh, I um, want to tell tell you first of all why I'm a gardener, and it's uh, there's only one real reason I'm a gardener. That's because I'm a good cook as well. I enjoy cooking as much as I do gardening, and when I garden, I'm really thinking of the kitchen. And so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is what I call my kitchen garden. And, um, and as I mentioned a little earlier, a kitchen garden is actually something very cultural for many societies. And it's a very really part of um, many countries to have their own kitchen garden so that you can go out and uh, look through your garden and say, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? And so that's my motivation for growing vegetables in the garden. Uh, for many years, I had a, uh, an acre of garden out in Langley. Um, and then uh, I, I only have a much smaller space now, which most people do have. Is, uh, it's a 33-foot wide lot in the middle of Vancouver in Kitsilano. So you'll be seeing uh, some of my Kitsilano kitchen garden. So I'm going to uh, going to put um, as sh the technical word is I'm going to put the share screen on so that we can see some of the pictures and of my garden and other places. So excuse me for just a second while I do that. So um, here we are in um, my kitchen garden. Now, to, uh, to describe it fully, I'd say that this particular spot has been gardened um, for about close to 40 years now. Um, and of course, when you have that much uh, age in a garden, sometimes you have to worry about uh, keeping certain pests out. And so one of the things you have to worry about in any garden is uh, pests. But I'm going to tell you, uh, for mostly for people who haven't gardened for 40 years, that it's not a big problem. Don't worry too much about pests. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is starting the garden, and I want to include uh, containers because uh, we, let's face it, in this world we're living in smaller and smaller spaces, and a lot of people don't have the luxury of uh, a big space and garden. So containers are part of gardening today. Uh, just to give you some, uh, I guess, goals, here's, uh, here's what I look for in October sometimes, uh, well, most years. We're talking about a list of vegetables that uh, are, they're not, most of them are not very rare. They're, uh, they're anything from uh, her a number of herbs to tomatoes, of course, and carrots and beans. And uh, they make up a lot of, of uh, what I like to put in my kitchen. Now, my goal in, in a garden is also to have year-round garden. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, but it's a winter gardening experience as well. So you'll see that some of the ones in the, the column are, are in red letters, if you can see the screen. And those are the ones that you can have in January as well as October or any, almost any month of the year. So you'll see that a lot of them are herbs, but carrots and uh, kale, Swiss chard, beets, that sort of root vegetable are also quite available. Uh, they're not, in, there's others as well. Uh, but um, in addition, of course, you can can vegetables, which I do, and tomatoes are, I think, the favorite of almost everyone. 
So how do how do you think in advance and how do you plan this vegetable garden? Well, I think a lot of it is on paper. Uh, you want to have a goal. And uh, of course, maybe your goal is not having one, uh, vegetables in December and January and February. Maybe it's you want to grow tomatoes or maybe you just want to grow something green. So um, the thinking about the garden is happens right now. And, and we're a little late. Actually, you could start even in March thinking about the garden. But uh, because this season is colder than usual, then uh, we're actually right on time. So start thinking about the seeds you want to grow and thinking about the soil you want to uh, use, whether it's a container or whether it's uh, your own garden. Now, from a purely gardening point of view, without worrying too much about this uh, dinnertime menu, uh, soil is soil and sun are the two biggest items you have to worry about. Uh, the soil is something that you, you cultivate, you encourage, but it's not something you could buy at a garden store. Soil is something that's built up over the years uh, with the whole idea of keeping care of the soil. It's got bugs in it lots of bugs and the bugs are almost always good there's a few bugs that aren't but uh, for the most part if you're if you're a commercial farmer you worry about bugs if you're a go home gardener you thank bugs uh, because most of the bugs in the garden are going to help you rather than hurt you uh, the other even probably more important than uh the happy soil is, in terms of a happy plant, is the sun. Uh, I, I, there is sad news out there for some people. If you do not have sun, you can grow lots of flowers, but really there's not much hope for growing vegetables. So, um, and when I say sun, I'm talking generally about, I would say, minimum six to eight hours a day. In the, in the summer, uh, because the sun, without the sun, um, those green leaves are not going to produce food. They can produce flowers and a lot of different flowers, but not, not food. So last item in this little list is, of course, nutrition. And, um, and there's a reason why I avoid, personally, I avoid chemical fertilizers. When you see something that says 20, 20, 20 on it, that means it's very high concentration and you have to worry about it too much. Uh, when you see something like 2, 2, 2, or even 4, 4, 4, that generally means that it's organic. And when you put it into the soil, it does not kill bugs. A 20, 20, 20 soil quite often will be so strong that it will kill bugs. Now, the exception to this is containers. Now, of course, you still want to use uh, a Gaia Green or another type of organic fertilizer, but of course, when you're in a container, you cannot put your garden soil in a container and hope to do well. The reason for that is that you don't, one of the reasons is you don't have bugs. Uh, bugs actually make soil uh, it allows soil to drain. And so if you don't have the bugs, then you have to have other methods. And so what you have to do with containers is to actually use artificial means whether with organic materials. And a garden soil generally has uh, lots of uh, vermiculite, uh, sorry, um, container soil has the vermiculite and other things that allows drainage. Without drainage, you will kill your plants. Um, so if you have a container uh, with regular soil and it's bigger than uh, just a few tiny containers, if it's a normal large container, you will drown your plants because they do not drain very well. So potting soil, the better the quality, the better is the first uh, recommendation for containers. And that's, of course, again, you want the sun and you want uh, nutrition. 
But the other thing about con uh, containers is that you have to worry more about watering. And so when I, uh, there's my little big asterisk, uh, the water. Uh, you have to water, depending on the size of your container, either every day or regularly, depending on what you're growing and depending on the temperature. Now, bugs. Uh, I think from a master gardener, uh, I just I should explain who, who a master gardener is. It's a, it's a group of people who, uh, in the Vancouver Master Gardeners, we uh, we study gardening all the time, and our principal goal is education uh, of the, the public uh, and an education of essentially what's called sustainable gardening. That is gardening that will will generally not destroy too much of the environment at the same time. It's not totally uh, organic, if, but certainly if you want to be organic, you're perfectly comfortable uh, in what we do. Uh, it's just that generally speaking, it's close to organic uh, most of the time. Now, my this is my own garden uh, count. This is, of course, uh, somewhat <laughs> arbitrary and uh, certainly an estimate, but uh, here's what I think happens in my garden and generally in a year. Uh, we've got these 30,000 good guys and we've got 5,000 bad guys. And the 5,000 bad guys are generally aph aphids. Well, I, I do um, use a one powerful weapon against aphids and that's a garden hose with water. So as long as you have a spray, you can spray those aphids off your plants, that's most of the job done. Uh, we'll talk about the other little uh, bugs a little later, but generally speaking, the rest of these rest of these uh, these bugs are good guys. Whoops! I have a problem here. I'm There we go. So um, we have the bugs out of the way. What are your goals? Or is your goal the tomato uh, or a variety? Or uh, there's a lot of gardeners out there who are very good at a few things. And I'm very happy to see them doing what they want. Uh, a number of people in, uh, in Vancouver like to grow garlic because garlic is, uh, it's pretty easy to grow uh, and uh, it's certainly rewarding. There's a bit of garlic in this little picture here, but this is uh, this is a sort of a typical summertime uh, harvest. Uh, we've got uh, chard, lettuce, zucchinis, peas, tomatoes, and carrots. That's my, my goal is a pretty well a wide one, and I'll tell you in a minute why uh, these particular vegetables are. Uh, are in the in the, the mix. We'll we'll talk about minestrone soup for a second. Now, I uh, I, I guess you could call minestrone is uh, really Italian, which is part of our food origins thing. But minestrone soup is really most of your kitchen garden vegetables. It can vary a bit. Uh, you can add uh, or subtract from uh, this general recipe, but generally you're talking about tomatoes, beans. Uh, some greens, arugula, kale, or whatever. You want a bit of basil in it, and of course, your salt and pepper. Um, olive oil is is a bit of a problem, but it's not as big a problem if you want to grow it. I, ha I have my own, actually one or two years I tried to grow olives, and olives do grow in British Columbia, mostly in the islands. Olives are, are really a little bit, um, I guess, closer to Oregon, if you want to uh, grow really good olives, but you can grow them here, but uh, I gave up on olives. They're, uh, they don't produce enough. <laughs> but I have, a, I have a neighbor who's uh, from, from Greece, and he's got uh, his, uh, his cousin in Greece, and he ships olive oil. So I give my, tomato to, uh, I give my neighbor tomatoes, and he gives me some olive oil. So I, I really brag about the fact that I actually can get some olive oil out of my garden. 
Now, um, I, I have a rule about growing any anything in my garden, in my back garden, actually in the front where there's no sun, there's a different rule. But in the back garden, I don't, if I can't eat it, I don't grow it. But there are a number of things you can grow, um, and these are some of them right here, that are actually very good for both the environment, the garden, and they're edible. And nasturtiums, I, I tend to like a lot. They, The thing about nasturtiums is that they attract aphids. And uh, when I get a lot of aphids on them, then I can just take the whole two thirds of the plant away and put it in the green bin. And there, there go the aphids, they're gone. So there, it's called a bait plant. But a lot of other flowers in the garden, uh, including the arugula here and uh, sage, and this is uh, monarda, um, um, bergamot is another word. They're all, they really protract lots of pollinators, lots of bugs. So if you want um, goals, I have a few more goals in mind. Um, these are some late, late uh, harvest pictures that I, I, uh, I want to uh, share with you. So we're, we're starting again with the minestrone soup, and it's something uh, that um, that um, that you can uh, think about as a year-round kitchen garden product. Most of the the vegetables in my garden can go into minestrone soup year round. Now, how are you going to, um, how does your garden grow? Well, uh, here's something to do right now. You don't have to do it with a computer, but this is mostly computer aided. This is a, um, this is a um, program called Garden Planner and I've had it for a number of years. And what it does is remembers from year to year what you planted in your garden. Now I happen to have a little greenhouse and I have these little raised beds all through here. There's about four or five raised beds and some of them are actually containers. And I like to rotate my, uh, my vegetables so that you don't have onions in the same spot two years in a row or garlic or leeks or anything of that nature. In fact, onions, garlics and leeks are the same family and you should treat them for purposes of growing in the same way. Most of them grow the same way, which is they start early and uh, grow all summer. Now, don't read, don't believe everything you see on the web, but I would say I suggest a few things that you can rely on. Look to England, why? Because England generally has the same climate as the lower mainland. So anything from the uh, Royal Horticultural Society or RHS is actually very good material if you're looking up vegetables on the web. And I do recommend that you do look up vegetables on the web. Very good source. University of Washington is close enough, of course, uh, to get uh, a slightly different view of, of uh, with more or less the same climate. So look local when you do your planning. And when it comes to seeds, which we'll talk about, buy local. Uh, but think again of what you want in your garden. Now carrots, um, you'd think would be very easy. And in fact, they there's certainly a lot of people grow carrots, but I want to talk a little bit about carrots and a few other vegetables. This is my one of my lists. I make a lot of lists about things that may be easy to start in a garden and things that are definitely worth it, but a little more work involved. So in the easy category, we have onions and beets and chard, lettuce, beans, uh, and so forth, and all the herbs. So if you wanna have a foolproof garden with very few crisis uh, moments, uh, grow herbs. Uh, they really are, they they don't worry about water as much. They don't worry about nutrition as much. They do like the sun. Most of, most of the herbs really like the sun. In the other category of worth it but not as easy, we have this list here. Anything in the tomato family, which includes peppers and eggplant, 
are uh, just takes a bit more work because they only grow in the hot heat of the summer and they have to be started early or you have to buy plants. Carrots, I want to talk about carrots only because uh, they have a special, uh, I have a special problem with them and so do a lot of other people and that's one of the pests. Remember those pest questions or pest, um, the carrot rust fly, there's only a few of them around my garden, but they do produce a problem. And what I have to do with carrots is that I have to be smarter than the carrot rust fly. Now, if you think a human brain is smarter than a fly brain, well, come and go, I'm not sure which is which, but having learned that the rust fly does not fly above 12 inches above the ground. So here's your rust fly, and here's a 13 inch box with carrots in it. Believe it or not, the carrot rust fly, which produces tiny little holes in your carrots, cannot fly over that big fence there. So this is where I grow my carrots, is in a high spot. You could call it a container, except the container has no bottom. Uh, and it's actually in soil, if you want to call it that. So uh, that's just one trick about carrots. They are, the other reason carrots are a little harder than some things is because they germinate very slowly. Beans will germinate in a week and you believe me, you know when a bean is germinated. They're big beans and they produce a big plant right away. Uh, same with uh, even tomatoes germinate very fast and but carrots take up to three weeks and because of that you have to be very patient whether it's a container or a garden. And the other problem with carrots is that uh, it's not they don't transplant easily. So again you have to grow them and where you're going to grow them. So after all that, they're still worth growing. So here are some other ideas. Uh, these are sort of traditional ways of starting now. If you're in the garden now, this is what you can think about is the easiest way to start your garden. Uh, so I'll just go through some of these. Uh, just it's a picture of a garden two or three years ago. Uh, there are some broad beans, which can be planted now, uh, beets, Maybe plant them in two or three weeks from now when it warms up a slight bit. Here's some uh, leeks which were started in the greenhouse and which are, have been transplanted to the garden. And there's some parsley, peas, and more onions, lettuce, two kinds of lettuce, I think. And uh, there we go. And some, and uh, some, I think that's wild celery, but we'll talk about that a little later. So I, I just want to pause right here uh, and um, I'm going to um, just go back to the, the screen for a second. And, and really ask uh, what sort of um, questions we have. I'm, uh, I see a few questions here. I'm just going to pause my presentation and, and answer a few questions. Uh, I think I've answered uh, the Coquitlam question about um, uh, good things now. Um, parsley and chives are dying in your containers on an east patio. Um, so on, on the east, uh, are you getting uh, six or eight hours of sunlight a day? Um, if they're in a container, uh, I Let's, let's divide the chives and the parsley. Parsley is generally an annual, so that if you have last year's parsley, it probably, like my parsley, it died off because it was a harsh winter. Uh, it can survive, but what it will do is go to seed very quickly this time of the year if it does survive. So I don't grow new parsley, uh, or I don't let it go over winter too uh, much in a bad winter like now. Now chives, uh, there can be sometimes, um, if the chives have been in the same container for three or four years, uh, I would say start a new batch. Uh, they seem to last three or four years with me and then uh, divide them uh, is one way to do it before they start uh, dying, but uh, um, chives don't last forever in the same spot. Now, oh, my next uh, Ronnie uh, has, has actually 
answer, ask a very good question, which I'll answer now. Um, coconut coir, I love it. I think we all should use it uh, or something similar. Using peat these days is very destructive to the environment. Coconut coir has two good things for it. Number one, uh, it is less environmentally harmful than peat because peat is actually stores carbon in the ground. And a lot of the carbon that's stored in the ground is in the form of peat and should not be taken out of the ground. And coconut coir has another quality and that is it's not acidic. Peat is acidic. Now coconut coir, um, it's not acidic, which means it's good for our gardens because our gardens are acidic and uh, because of all the rain we have. So from every point of view, coconut coir mixed with other things that drain the soil is very good for the environment and it's good for growing things. So what's the reason for rotating vegetables? Well, it's mainly pests, uh, pests in the ground. Uh, when I say that most bugs are good, they are good when they all work together. And for instance, if you have ladybugs, they eat the uh, aphids and so forth. But onions in particular, um, and a few other vegetables, cabbage, there's two, two families of vegetables that need um, good rotation because there are pests in the ground, diseases uh, more than bugs, but diseases like rot and fungus that are um, that stick in the soil all winter. So if you put onions there one or two or three years in a row, you're going to ask for problems. The same with members of the cabbage family. There's three or four things in the cabbage family that uh, that pests, underground pests, whether they're animal or vegetable, like to stick around all winter. When you plant a new cabbage, you're going to have problems. So put them somewhere else the second year. And uh, just one more answer before I go on. Um, quality of seeds. It depends on the seeds. Now I, I, uh, I'm unab unabashedly support local seed growers. There's two reasons for that. Number one, local seed growers use seeds that are meant for this location. Uh, and secondly, um, the West Coast and Salt Spring seeds are the two companies that I know about that uh, produce locally. They have uh, a very good, and they're in self-interest. They want to be mostly uh, organic. Uh, they're not all organic, and I don't know if that's possible, but they're mostly organic in the, in the general sense of the word. Uh, I'm going to go back to my presentation, but just to say one question about mulberries, I just don't know the answer. Uh, so uh, there we go. We'll, we'll come back to questions later. Um, uh, so um, I'm going to... Now, I was talking about the uh, minestrone soup before, and I want to tell you the reason that I uh, am a big fan of minestrone soup in, in my own garden. Uh, you have a chart here, it's the same recipe as before, and on the left hand of this chart, we have the number of months in a year that they're available from your garden. Now, if you include my uh, little side reference to olive oil, uh, I can have onions out of the garden about uh, eight or nine months of the year. Uh, sometimes if I save the onions, I can have them 12 months of the year, but uh, I usually run out of onions before then. Carrots, same thing. Celery or wild celery, which is um, an easier grow. Uh, uh, garlic, that's the whole reason that people grow garlic is they can keep it all year. Rosemary, herb, definitely all year. Tomatoes, you have to use canned tomatoes, but they're good in soup. Beans, now green beans say, uh, are only available three or four months of the year, but dried beans and frozen beans are uh, good all year. Well, we won't talk about the pasta and the chicken broth, 
uh, because they're not from my garden. Uh, but again, when you have uh, spinach, kale, all of those green vegetables, they are available 12 months of the year. At least the, the kale and the Swiss chard are. Arugula, not so much, but it's, uh, it's available a lot of the year. Basil, well, you can only get basil in the summer, but then you can freeze it with pesto. So that, there's my, uh, my um, ode to minestrone soup and why it's a great kitchen garden vegetable. Now, I like to look forward to summer and right and the, these terrible days today, which uh, even in Kitsilano, we had hail for the third day in a row today. Um, I'm looking forward to summer. And some of the things that I uh, look forward to are the full kitchen garden. Now, I want to go back years ago when I visited a garden in France called um, uh, Villandry, which um, all of this, believe it or not, is a kitchen garden. Now, it's a kitchen garden of a, uh, of a famous chateau in France, but the, all of these are vegetables and they're uh, beautiful. And you can uh, maybe try to make your garden beautiful. I'm, I'm a little messy, as you can see below. My kitchen garden is, uh, is got, at any time of the year, has got weeds in it as well. And, uh, and I don't worry too much about weeds as long as at the beginning of a year, I let the vegetables have, uh, have the first shot at the soil. A few weeds later on, not a problem with me. If you have a problem with weeds, go feel free to get rid of them. For me, I leave them for the bugs, for the pollinators. Now, uh, I was talking a little bit about the language uh, of, uh, of, uh, of food. Uh, and I am a believer in uh, research uh, on vegetables. And I like to grow vegetables all of, from all over the world. And the reason, and, and one of the things I have to do when I grow these vegetables is I have to look up and do research mainly on the internet, about where these vegetables come from. And so uh, if I know that garlic comes from Siberia, I know it's gonna be a pretty good winter vegetable. And that's in fact what happens. You grow, uh, you grow garlic all winter and let it uh, um, then of course grow into the summer. Uh, but other areas, most of the herbs we grow in Vancouver are from the Mediterranean, uh, France and Spain and Italy. And so that's good to know. Uh, most, uh, many of the vegetables like squash and uh, tomatoes and beans are from Latin America. And in fact, from the indigenous uh, areas of uh, Latin America, mainly Mexico, just I don't know if you know about the three sisters. These are... Um, three vegetables that really don't need fertilizer when they're grown together, but only when they're grown together. So um, for a thousand years, the same piece of land has been used in parts of Mexico to grow the three sisters. Now, who are the three sisters? Well, they're squash, which is this particular sister, they're corn, and they're beans. So what happens is the uh, the corn grows up tall and the squash vines climb up on the corn vines and the beans the same way. And beans produce the fertilizer in the ground for the other two. And uh, it's, it's the um, secret that the aboriginals of Mexico and, and now the Mexican uh, farmers still use today. Um, so knowing where vegetables come from and knowing the climate of those vegetables is really important part of your, of your uh, research when you decide what to grow. Now, if you wanna grow something tropical, uh, you'll have problems. Uh, I, I know there's probably two or three people in Vancouver who still try to grow, grow bananas, but uh, I, uh, I don't give them much hope. So find out the vegetables you want to grow and find out if you can grow them. Um, now, um, another thing I like to do with, uh, with food is, of course, the recipes from these various countries. And uh, that's when uh, you can 
find uses for uh, all of them. I, I like to grow daikon, which is a radish. There's a good reason for that. Radishes are two or three weeks in the summer if you uh, just plant them once or twice, but big radishes like daikon uh, grow so that you can use them all winter. They're really good for that. So um, I like to know where they're from and how people in the various countries use them. Uh, and in fact, my kitchen garden has much better words than another other languages. I, I don't know how many, I didn't see any people from Italy, but I'm sure you have, you know, chances are there's somebody from Italy in this crowd. Uh, so we have got the various words for kitchen garden. Huerta in Spanish, uh, orto, and of course we've got the Latin where um, many of our words come from. Now I have a little thing, and this is not only for master gardeners. Master gardeners have to speak a little loud, because when it comes down to it, um, when it comes down to it, the if you really want to be precise about a vegetable, you have to use Latin, because sometimes words are very confusing uh, uh, about vegetables. So uh, I'm now surely I'm going to. Um, this is hard to read on the screen, but uh, I'm certainly happy to send you a copy if you want to be able to make it available to anybody who's listening or looking at this. This is a list quite detailed of the vegetables that uh, I generally grow in the garden, and they're listed in three categories. And uh, the first list is, is similar to what I've said before. Um, there's easy, medium, and difficult. Just to concentrate on some of the uh, uh, difficult ones, there's things like Jerusalem artichoke, which I grow, and they're really hard to stop growing. They're not difficult to grow, but what the problem with Jerusalem artichokes are is that they are difficult to stop. They grow all over the place, and once you plant them, they'll take over your garden. So that's a difficulty in itself. And so you have to know about problems in the garden such as Jerusalem artichokes from not from a hard to grow but from an easy to grow point of view. Uh, I'll just pick out one more cilantro which is a herb uh, easy to grow but it will go to seed right away and there's nothing you can do to stop it. You only have cilantro for three three weeks and that's the end of your cilantro without planting why didn't you plant more. Um, broad beans. Um, now they're another traditional English vegetable, good to plant right now or earlier. They'll produce uh, big old broad beans in uh, July, uh, but they are one of the few vegetables around that really produce and attract aphids. I like to grow them and I just have to use my garden hose on them to keep the aphids off. So there's any number of, uh, of easy vegetables, uh, again the herbs are easy. Uh, but uh, I just want to concentrate on a few that I, I think are a little bit exotic, exotic, but pretty easy. Now, tomatillos are almost like tomatoes, except they have this little shell around them. Uh, they are green, and in fact, the Spanish is green tomato, is what they, uh, they usually call them, tomate uh, de verde. And so what the... Uh, the difference between a tomato and this is that these are not susceptible to blight. Tomatoes in Vancouver, in the lower mainland, uh, will, once the rains start in October, they will wilt and they will stop producing tomatoes because we have almost universal blight. If they're under cover, they are usually a lot better, but uh, that takes a lot of work as well. So uh, try these exotic vegetables if you want. Tomatillo is one of them. Um, here's another way of looking at the ease of vegetables. The, I have this list is things that do well in containers. Now, generally the rule is in containers, if they have shallow roots, they probably do better in containers. So most of these vegetables here, arugula, chives, lettuce, radish, um, and even tomatoes, um, they all have, tomatoes have deeper roots, but they still are very good container 
Um, so they all have shallow roots for the most part. And some of the difficult ones, um, uh, not from a container point of view, but from, from just a general growing point of view, are the ones that require lots of heat in the summer. Uh, eggplant, to peppers, cucumbers, Depending on how much sun you have, you may have real problems with peppers, eggplants, and cucumbers. Uh, for other reasons, uh, nasturtium might be a hard one. Uh, even though a lot of people grow it, that's the one with the aphids. So again, uh, uh, know your vegetable. So I'm having, uh, 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 I, I guess my last, uh, thank you is to all of the good bugs. And this is my special friend, the ladybug. Um, the ladybug does eat aphids, but it's a sign that your garden is doing well. It's a sign that all, everything is in more or less a good balance when you see ladybugs around. And I wish you, each and every gardener, have a ladybug or two in your garden. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of technical issues now about starting. Uh, but first, I want to tell you to give some room to the pollinators. Uh, this is a bergamot plant or bee balm or uh, there's other names, Monarda. Uh, it's, Monarda is the Latin, but some people use the Latin in, as well as English. Great plant. It, uh, you can eat all of this, uh, these little flowers here uh, as well. Now, when you start a garden, you almost always start with seeds. Now this time of the year, um, th this happens to be a, a squash plant, uh, a little too early to start them, although I have, and I have them indoors, of course, in little containers. Um, you want to, uh, you need some help uh, if you start indoors this time of the year. Uh, well, first of all, you need to look, believe it or not, at the seed packet. Uh, this is something that uh, probably for the most part, if you use West Coast seeds or local seeds, two thirds or more of all of the information you need is found on the seed packet. Usually says what uh, month they plant in, what month they grow in, how big they are, and when to start. Uh, if, if it doesn't say that, look it up on the internet or uh, other places. So this is, these are a few of what I'm planting right now. Uh, actually, this is maybe two or three weeks old and uh, tomatoes here, there's celery, uh, that's tomatillos and some, uh, oh, these, these are uh, wild celery. Uh, wild celery uh, is a little easier to grow than regular celery. The stalks are not as big but so you eat the, both the leaves and the, the stalks. So the, if you're doing this, you can do it indoors with lights, or if you are lucky enough to have a greenhouse, you can do it in a greenhouse as well. But uh, now's the time to start some of these plants. But if you're lazy or you don't want to be, you don't have the equipment, there's nothing wrong with going to your local nursery. And most of these can be found in your local nursery. So if you don't want to do this, don't worry about it. You can still have a great garden. In fact, uh, most of my herbs, I, I think are a little too difficult to start from seeds. So I, I get, well, some of my herbs are 20 years old because once you start them, they're perennial and usually they will last for years and years. So herb gardeners, no problem. You can go from year to year with the uh, same herbs. But for the people who want to start their seeds, this is a little heat mat, doesn't take much electricity. It's just slightly warm. These are the containers you can start uh, your vegetables in. The one thing I haven't mentioned is that you need uh, potting soil or starting soil and it should be sterilized. Uh, and that's usually only obtainable in, in nurseries and, and garden shops. So, then you want to look at your seeds and there's both uh, online and uh, catalog and printed seed catalogs. The best, if you want to call the reference book that I use the most, it's the West Coast Seed, seed Catalog. 
you can see a lot of information on the seed catalog and also on your seeds. Uh, these are tomatoes. These are tomatoes generally that I think are great, but there's a lot of ones and a lot of people have different choices. The other way of um, starting some, a lot of herbs and some vegetables, including even squash, is um, cloning or rooting. Now this happens to be a, um, a sage plant. Just put it in water and this is about two weeks old and uh, the roots start right away. Uh, now it's similar to what's going on here. This is not rooting, this is actually growing from seed, but it's in a hydroponic container. This happens to be a little fish tank with a few uh, little plastic things hanging down into water. Uh, that's a, it's a, I think it's a little harder than most growing, but if you want to try uh, wintertime winter time lettuce, that's, that's another idea. Now, uh, I'm not going to talk about seed saving so much right now, but I just want to let the idea out there that a lot of the seeds you have in your garden uh, can be saved. And in fact, these two are seeds that it's hard not to save. Uh, the first is beans. Uh, of course, you can have your green beans, but if you let them grow uh, to maturity, they will always produce in the end, dried beans, if uh, you go that far. Of course, you like to eat the green beans before that. Uh, the other one is, this is, anybody know about this one? Well, I, I will won't ask for a guess right now. This is cilantro. These seeds are um, what's known as coriander, another name for it. Um, they, as I mentioned before, cilantro is, I, I love cilantro as, as a herb, but it only lasts for three or four weeks, then it goes to seed. So there's your seed. You always get it if you grow cilantro. So I'm going to open it up again for questions in a moment. I just wanted to let you know that uh, this is the time we are in prime garden starting season um, and uh, looking forward to a little warmer weather because we certainly need it right now. Um, I've started these. I've put them out in the garden. It may be almost, it's certainly, it can be wait, it can wait a week or two, but uh, if you have onions either from sets or from seeds, uh, they certainly will be growing well right now. Um, this is my la this is something that happens in about another month. If you really want, if you have the room, this is called a, uh, a cloche, it's a big cloche, and it's it, it's a black and white picture because you can see the tomatoes inside better through the glass. Uh, this is plastic, actually, not glass. But if you start a month early under cover, this you can remove all of this plastic in about a month, in the first of June. Uh, tomatoes are and a lot of and eggplants and a lot of other vegetables just do not like cool weather. Never mind frost, they just don't do well in cool weather. They like the hot weather. So this is my little idea, and I a lot of other people use it too, to get tomatoes going a month early or so. So I'm going to uh, go back to the screen now and um, look at more questions. Uh, if you have questions, uh, I'm, I'm opening it up for certainly a lot more. Uh, I'm looking at a couple of questions right now. Uh, uh, I think there was one question here, explain how to start seeds. Well, I've uh, tried to cover that, I think, I hope. Um, uh, looking at some of the other questions. Watering spikes, uh, containers. Uh, I would think uh, they're not, they're certainly useful, but not necessarily, it depends on the size of your container. You always want to have a container with room to put water in anyway. You don't want the soil up to the top. You want a little room. So oh, no, nothing wrong with watering spikes, except that I probably would prefer to use them in uh, under trees and things. Um, so uh, thanks for uh, 
uh, Lori, for listing lots of West Coast and other seed um, seed sellers. Um, so um, I'm going to answer a couple of questions uh, now about, well, first of all, rosemary. Is rosemary cold hardy? Absolutely. Uh, rosemary, nine years out of 10 will do well in uh, the lower mainland. Uh, there is a problem with rosemary. There's two problems with rosemary and really wet weather. It doesn't like to be drowned like a lot of herbs. Uh, it likes a well-drained soil. So um, it, some rosemary gets waterlogged and it dies more from being drowned than being cold. Now, generally speaking, it will last through most winters, but if it gets to minus 10, minus 11, minus 12 Celsius, you get it gets certainly uh, damaged quite a bit. Most of the time it will survive, but at a, in a damaged state. So. Uh, it, it's a touch and go once it reaches minus 10 or minus 11. Um, so basil, uh, Thai basil or any kind of basil, uh, pretty much the same. It's a hot weather. It's one of the hottest vegetable, hot weather vegetables to grow. Uh, it's so, it likes heat so much that I generally keep it in the greenhouse. Uh, we're talking about really hot weather is, is what basil likes. So you can start it inside and you can see it in nurseries, but I wouldn't put it out until the 1st of July in a garden. Um, but, uh, and so keep it warm if you're growing basil and uh, a lot of the varieties are just for the summer, but they, it's a really a nice herb to grow, wonderful to eat as well. Um, Tomatoes and strawberries for hanging baskets. Well, I think they're very similar to containers. Uh, I don't think there's much difference. Uh, um, so started a raised bed. Uh, everyone should try to have raised beds in this area. Problem is we have rain, too much rain and drainage is almost always a problem. And raised beds do two things. They first of all, allow drainage a lot better and secondly, they allow the soil to warm up a little earlier in the year. Well, and there's another reason for people like me who uh, don't like bending down as much as I used to, and that's as uh, it makes gardening a little easier just not to have to go down to the, the surface. Now, should you add soil to start the bed again? Um, add what are called amendments. Don't change any soil, just keep adding manure, uh, compost, anything that's uh, in that category of, uh, of organic material, if you want to raise the bed more, uh, do it gradually. Uh, I, I don't think that going to, uh, a, you know, a, a nursery and finding huge amounts of soil and putting it on is going to help that much, except to raise it. So um, do it gradually. Uh, let those bugs thrive in what's there now. Uh, containers, ground level, uh, you want drainage. The big thing about containers is whether they're ground level or patio level is uh, you want to allow, allow for drainage. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you James for the uh, presentation. It's very informative and very interesting. So thank you so much.